again wearing a tie. I was examining brains on my balcony in my apartment in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And when I got the big brains, I couldn't examine them on my balcony because my neighbors could call the cops on me. So I would sneak in in the evenings to the basement of a university hospital. And the chairman of the Department of Neurosurgery would sneak me in when there was nobody there. Because there was not even a single university organization or hospital that would let me examine veins within their institution. Because I had a somewhat weird concept. Some even suggested that I was practicing voodoo. I did not know these pictures were taken. They were taken by my wife then. I had been married to her for about six months. She was wondering what a weird man she had married <laughs> that would be examining friends at home. And she took this picture secretly so that when she eventually made up her mind to leave me, she would have some justification. <laughs> she would send these pictures to my family and to her family. Next uh, p um, picture, please. Now you can see, like you saw in the movie, I examined brains on my dining table, on my kitchen table. Some of the brains came in boxes like that, and if you could look at that picture, it was quite late at night. Sometimes I looked at those brains even all night, because I had no light. You could see in the picture how big my tummy was. I'm not ashamed to admit to you, because this is a medical crowd. Yes, I suffered depression. I still suffer from depression today. I may have had too many a bottle of Henneke, but I'm not ashamed of it. I had no life. I had such a low self esteem That's the last picture. But to understand my life, my brothers and sisters, you need to look into my childhood. I was born on September 1, 1968, during the Nigerian Biafran War. My parents and my family were refugees in a small mountain village. Now, why my parents chose to conceive me in a time of war, I do not know. Maybe sex is the only reasonable recreational activity in a time of war. So rather than seeing my conception as a conception, I see it as a misconception. My mother, as expected, suffered war-related malnutrition and stress. We were refugees. When I was born, first two, three years of my life, I suffered war-related malnutrition and psychological trauma. In fact, the day I was born, in a dilapidated refugee hospital, just like you have in Aleppo today, the Nigerian armed forces were constantly bombarding the refugee camps, just like you have in Aleppo today. The day I was born, my father was hit by one of those bombs. And he was lying dead by the street side. And the Catholic charities actually picked up his body to place in a trunk. In a trunk. With so many other dead bodies. And he groaned. So they brought him to the same hospital I was born in. In fact, till he died two years ago, he had shrapnels all over his body. They believed he was going to die. But for some reason, the medical studies turned around. Two weeks later, he was able to sit up and... His child was placed on his thighs. And he looked upon me and gave me the name Bennett. Bennett from the French word Benoit, which means to be blessed. And then he gave me a Middle African name, If I Can Do. My nine year old daughter calls it If I Can Do. But what it means is that life is the greatest gift of all. And then my last name actually is not Hamalu. My last name is Onyemalu Kube. But when my father went to Cornwall, England, after the Second World War to study mining engineering, Onyemalu Kube was too long a name for the Englishman to say. So he cut his shot to Amalu, and I'm very grateful to him for that, because it has simplified my own life. <laughs> but what Onyemalu Kube means is, it's he who knows must come forth and speak. So my brothers and sisters, my journey in America has been an epitome of my name, of my names. Blessed. Life is the greatest gift of all.
he who knows must come forth and speak. Oh yes, the first couple of years of my life, I suffered the traumas of war. I'm the shortest in my family. In fact, my younger sister is much taller than I am. I did not suffer only physical trauma. I suffered psychological trauma. So growing up, they labeled me with social adjustment disorder. I had such a miserably low self-esteem. I suffered depression. I was extremely anti-social. The local kids of the, of the neighborhood, my brothers and sisters, made fun of me. And it made me become more withdrawn. But in the darkness of my misery, I discovered the power of the imagination. I discovered the power of knowledge, the power of education. I realized that when I knew something that someone else did not know, I had some power and authority over that person. So what did I do? In my sense of inadequacy, I empowered myself by embracing education. Luckily, I became highly intellectually competent. That I, became, I began grade school at the age of three, got into medical school at the age of 15, and became a physician at the age of 21. The power of education. But I paid a price for it. In my imagination as a child, I imagined myself becoming a pilot, flying big jumbo passenger jets across the world from one major city to the other, maybe fly from San Francisco to Paris, spend one or two nights in Paris with a beautiful French woman, <laughs> fly from Paris to Sydney, spend two or three nights in Sydney, spend yet nights with a beautiful Australian woman, fly back to San Francisco, spend yet another night with a beautiful American woman. But as laughable as that may sound, that was a true depiction of who I was born to be. To enjoy the simple things of life, live a simple life, and possibly die a simple death. But I became a victim of the conformational intelligence of society. Because I was intellectually gifted. In those days in Nigeria, the society in Nigeria believed that the smartest kids went to medical school, no matter what you wanted to study. And my father pretty much said to me, Bon, you're going to medical school. And when I said, oh, daddy, I want to be a pilot, he said, shut up, that is irresponsible of you. And I got into medical school. As I expected, I took the exam, but I was part of the top 2%. I got into medical school. You all know how rigidly structured and regimented the life of a medical student is. I couldn't cope. My depression became worse. I dropped out of medical school. Society did not understand me, but a psychiatrist labeled me with developmental crisis in adolescence. Some called me a truant. My father called me spoiled. And I was forced back to medical school. I kept on keeping on. My grades went down south. In fact, in the final year of medical school, in our yearbook, under my section with my picture, while other people wrote long treatises of what they wanted to be or become, CEOs, best neurosurgeons, best orthopedic surgeons, whatever, there was only one line, to be myself, three words. My brothers and sisters, to be myself, that was why I came to the United States of America, to be myself. Growing up in Nigeria, I read about America in books, saw America in movies. Like you saw in the movie Concussion, yes, I believe America was the only country that was closest to what God wants us to be as his sons and daughters. A country where you could be whatever you want to be. A country where you could be yourself. A country that invites some that great individual ingenuity. A country whereby the state is answerable to the individual. Not the individual answerable to the state like you have in China and Russia. And that is why China or Russia can never be as great as America. And I came to America. Thank you.
October 24, 1994, I had only $250 in my pocket. I rented a room for $26 in an attic home in an elderly lady's home in the university district. Later that morning, she rented the room to me for about $175 a month. So I began school at the University of Washington in Seattle. I was a visiting research scholar. You saw my family, a devout Catholic family. I was raised as a child to believe in the goodness of mankind. As amazing as it may, as it may sound, I wasn't aware of some dark times in human history. I did not know about the Holocaust. I had no idea of America's experience of slavery or racism. I honestly did not. But in the first two weeks of my life in America, I began to notice that some people treated me differently. I would be walking home at night, some people would see me and cross the street. I'd be walking home at night, some cars would see me and turn on their full beam. I would stop by by a grocery store close to my house to buy grocery supplies because I had no refrigerator. But whenever I walked in that, into that grocery store, maybe within 30 minutes, two or three people would have asked me, can I help you? Police officers who pull me over almost on daily basis. Sometimes the same police officer asking me the same questions. So I thought there was something I was doing wrong because the first time I bought something from that grocery store, it was $2.99. When I got, got to the cashier, she said it was $3 something. I thought she was cheating me. I got upset and left. So I walked to the elderly lady. I said, this was what happened. She said, no, 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 Bennett, in America, there is sales tax. <laughs> in most other parts of the world, there is the value added tax, which is part of the price. So I walked up to her. I said to her, ma'am, these are my experiences. Is there something culturally anomalous I was doing? Maybe the way I walked. She laughed at me in a very sarcastic manner. I said, welcome to your America, Bennett. Now, do me a favor, go to the library. She was a retired historian. These are the, this is the section you have to go to. These are the books you have to read. And very early in the morning, I rushed off to the library. By the time I was in the middle of the book, I became very dejected and very unhappy. I did not go to school for two days. My food was the good old Guinness stout. By the second day, that quiet voice in me said to me, Ben, what are you going to do? Erase American history? What are you going to do? Come on, wake up. Remember as a child, I discovered the power of education, the power of the imagination. My brothers and sisters, that is why today I have eight degrees and professional certificates. I may have overcompensated, but it's all well and good. Because in the darkness of my misery, I learned some life lessons. I learned that I am an individual just like each and every one of us here. My name is Bennett Kamalo. Your name may be Jennifer Hammers, Robert Fitzsimmons. Whatever your name may be, there is only one me or one you. And there can only be one you or one me throughout all eternity.